If you wanted to invest $100,000 in stocks, you could do it in two minutes on your phone. Bonds, two minutes on your phone. Gold, 10 minutes. But if you wanted to invest $100,000 in investment grade wine, a $250 billion asset class that has had a 1,000% return in the last 20 years, you wouldn't be able to do it in a week because... David Garrett, the co-founder and CEO of Deven Labs. A company building the operating system for the $100 billion wine industry. You are onto the next level. Blockchain meets a rare wine. What is Deven? Deven decentralized wine. The wines that we're putting on the blockchain are luxury and investment grade wine. The reason we put it on the blockchain is because we turn it from a possession into an asset. Wine as an asset class is $10 billion a year in turnover, but it's completely taken over by the older generations. I took full advantage of the American dream. After I graduated, I started a tech company. By the time I was 28, I sold it. It made me really hungry. I kind of dedicated the rest of my life to experiencing things. Why should every kid go explore the world and get lost as early as possible? I think the best gift that you can give to your children is being able to experience other cultures, to know the world. I spend a lot more money on experiences that I'm going to remember for the rest of my life than I do on any possessions. So you said for the first part of your life, you had no idea about what was happening in the world, but then you built businesses in six countries and visited more than a hundred. What's your biggest takeaway from moving that much? I learned that 75% of you that watch this channel frequently do not subscribe. If you like this show and think it provides value to you in your crypto investing journey, can you please, please, please do me a favor and subscribe to this channel. Hit the like button and leave a comment below. It helps this channel more than you can imagine. The bigger the channel, the bigger the guests and the better the conversation. Thank you. Today's conversation is supported by Jupiter, the most used decentralized exchange in crypto and the largest DEX by volume on Solana. Mantle, a leading Ethereum layer two with more than $2 billion in total value locked and $3 billion in liquid treasury. And Astar Network, a scalable network connecting people to Web3 through entertainment, blockchain development, and community events. As soon as you live outside of the States, or maybe it's just when you live outside of the place where you grew up uh, probably for long also. enough, like you just can't go back. It's not, it's not interesting. It's not fun. Maybe someday. But Exoti like, exotism? Do we call that? Did you say that in English? Yeah, maybe. It's like we're also attracted by, I mean, men by women who are maybe sure. from somewhere else and women by men who are some, from somewhere else, right? For sure. Just like you, you're just like more attracted to what's kind of exotic to you, right? And, uh, one of the other thing that's really interesting about moving a lot is you start to see first that life can be different. Life quality is not the same everywhere, yeah. right? And you start to make yourself like some opinions that are different from what you've been taught. Yeah. Switzerland is the best place on earth. Why would you leave? Yeah. I mean, yeah, we I got that a little bit in the States too. Yeah. I mean, I don't yeah. think Switzerland actually tells you that. It's more the people in Switzerland who are very proud yeah. who will say, we have, ev which is true, we have everything, right? right. In Switzerland, you have everything. Like it's, it's top notch life quality. But if you're trying to build stuff, this, this little magic like is missing because there's not a big, I mean, there's no risk taking culture, which by the, in the US is great. Right? One of the great yeah. things in the US is people just go and don't really care about failing. Yeah. So, I mean, every, there's no perfect place. It's something I learned, like it's, everything is a trade off, right? But there is definitely places that are, that are 10, 50 times better than others, like literally. Well, for me, a lot of it, it you know, you talked about needing the sun during, during COVID. For me, the weather is really important. Mm. Like I grew up in Michigan. It was cold. It rained all summer. It snowed all winter. I was always cold. I was always miserable. Never wanted to go outside. Mm. It was too hot. In the middle of summer, it was too hot. Bugs everywhere. Like it just... I really didn't like being outside. And uh, as soon as I moved to a different climate, like I just wanted to be outside all the time. And now I want to be outside all the time. Uh, I spend too much time in front of my computers, but I, I like being outside. And, and the, the weather really makes a big difference to me. My wife is kind of thinking about London as like a, a place for us to have a, another play, another house or you know a second place. And I'm like, I don't know idea. if I can handle the weather. I lived yeah. there for three years, like, oh. I can, again, I think we were talking about that with Raul yesterday. We're like, terrible. Yeah. Like, the, just the weather, it's, and there's so many other problems with London right now. Yeah. But already, I lived there from 2015 to 2018. 
I don't, I don't understand why you would live there. If you experienced other places, it, it doesn't make sense in terms of taxes, in terms of, of safety, in terms of life quality, in terms of housing of quality, yeah. in terms of weather, in terms sure. of... So... The culture. There's some interesting culture. I love, like, theater in London is fantastic. The um, uh, art, the museums, the music... Like London has a lot of great culture that's hard to replicate in other places. Yeah. But, uh, but yeah. But you can go there. Oh, you can a, go to a visit. A week or two. That's right. For me, London is a great place to go for three, four, five days, but like yeah. not to stay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, at least for me, everybody's different, right? I but feel the same way. Let's start with the basics. Who are you? Uh, Dave Garrett. I'm uh, the founder of Divin. Um, along with a lot of other businesses uh, in wine and tech. So you m br uh, you mentioned briefly your childhood in the U.S., right? And you told me that you didn't get onto an airplane until 20, and that when you did, you did it all by yourself. You said, I didn't leave the U.S. until 26. Yeah. And when I did, I never came back. So your story kind of sounds like the opposite of what we're, what we're being taught, right, with the American dream. Yeah. Do you want to elaborate? Sure. I mean, I, look, I, um, I took full advantage of the American dream, right? I grew up in, um, in a little town in Michigan. My, my parents were both school teachers. Um, I, you know, our family vacations were, were cross-country road trips uh, when we did it. I went to Disneyland once. Um, And uh, in a pretty short period of time after I graduated, I started a tech company. Um, and by the time I was 28, I sold it. So uh, that, was, that was great. And I, I, um, I experienced the American dream and then thought to myself, I, I, didn't, I got some financial success and some professional success, but I haven't, I haven't seen anything. I haven't mm. experienced anything. And I kind of dedicated the rest of my life to experiencing things. Why should every kid go explore the world and get lost as early as possible? Oh, man. I mean... You have kids, I, right? Yeah. So my daughter's 13. What are you going to do with her? <laughs> she was born in Argentina. Okay, she already moved a lot then. Yeah. We, uh, I think when she was... She had a passport... Within a week, at three months, we took our first uh, intercontinental vacation, took her to Spain. Um, she's lived in Hong Kong. She's lived in Spain. She's lived, we lived in the States for, for a couple of years. Um, she's traveled all over. She speaks multiple languages. She's comfortable anywhere. We always say uh, if, if our family ever got deserted on a desert island, they would find her sitting on a pile of our bones. Um, she's resilient and tough and um, happy and healthy. And I think that um, she has a, a really great balanced worldview for someone who's 13. And I, I don't think I had that until I was 30 mm. or, or maybe older or, or maybe I still don't have it. Um, I think that, that what the best gift that you can give to your children is uh you know being able to experience other cultures being able to to know the world so you're based in barcelona now right yeah based in barcelona she is also in barcelona therefore yeah are you planning to because you've moved a lot with her right but you were with her yeah you plan on sending her somewhere for like a year or a couple of years to because that's probably where Now she's kind of equipped already, which you were not, right? Until yeah. 26. But like the next level is, I mean, obviously she's, a, she's your daughter. She's a woman. So maybe as a dad, it's harder, right? But the next level is to send your kids probably somewhere. and Yeah. So I they get lost and have their own experiences, right? That's where they learn the most. So we've, we've been talking a lot about that. I think that having a, like a gap year mm -hmm. after, after high school, um, I... I'd be willing to support that. I think mm. that'd be really interesting for her. I, I think that that maybe I would have made some different decisions 
I don't know if better, but I would have made different decisions had I, you know, taken that gap year. I, I was different. I mean, I, I started working full time while I was in college and never looked back. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I, I don't think I had a day off until I sold my company. Uh, and then um, and then I started really experiencing the world and, and really experiencing life. So I, I don't know. I think I, I'd love for her to do a gap year. I'd love for her to go in, uh, whether that's, you know, start a business in, in London or, or, you know, work at a nonprofit in Southeast Asia, like whatever it is, take a year and do something fun and interesting and productive. Do you think you'd have worked that hard on your first company had you discovered more of the world earlier? I don't know. I was hungry, right? Like I, I, when I was in college, it was, I kind of opened my eyes when I went to college, right? I got to university. I'd lived in this very small town, um, kind of bubble existence. I didn't really know anything about the world. And I got to college. I went to Michigan State, big university. I got to meet people from all over the world. Um, certainly a lot of people from outside of both my social and economic spheres. And it just it made me really hungry. Mm. Uh, and I just wanted more. Uh, and, you know, m- both my parents are, I, I think they, they both came from um, kind of well-to-do families and they, they didn't really have any interest in like professional, not a lot of interest in professional success or economic success. Like they were happy. They wanted a happy, simple life. Uh, and we had one. I had a great, great childhood grew up, never needed anything, but never wanted anything either because I didn't know what was there. Uh, as soon as I got to university, I saw the world and I wanted to eat the whole thing. So you said for the first part of your life, you had no idea about what was happening in the world, but then you built businesses in six countries and visited more than a hundred. What's your biggest takeaway from moving that much? Or the, learning? I, um, so I learned that, uh, well, I, so I learned a lot. I think, you know, one thing is, um, you learn what's important to you when you move from country to country, like you can't take everything. Um, what's the most important to you? Always things that you can't replace. Uh, and, and what I've learned over time is, you know, I stop, I, I only buy things that I want to keep forever. Like I don't buy anything that is, you know, interesting for me for a minute or that I might use for fun for tomorrow. I only buy things that I want to keep forever. Mm. Um, and so I only buy things that are very high quality um, and things that I think are going to provide a lot of happiness and utility. Um, so I think... Do you have I some think, examples? Um, I mean, for better for worse, it's wine. Right. Mm. Like I buy, uh, I don't, I, I have a pretty healthy wine collection, as you might imagine, mm. I have a lot of wine, but, um, but I don't, I only buy wine that, um, that I think is going to, is going to be not, not just give me pleasure when I drink it, but is going to like support the winemaker is going to tell a story, um, for me. I, I think that's a, that's a big one. Like I don't, I don't really have a car. I don't really, um, I mean, we, we have a, a beater that we take my, my daughter to her, her, her classes in, but like, mm. we don't really have those kinds of things. Like I, I spend a lot more money on experiences that I'm gonna remember for the rest of my life than I do on any possession. So basically you told me that uh, one of your favorite things is um, collecting wine. One of yeah. the few things that you buy, right? Yeah. Do you want to tell me more about that? Sure, but like we should have this conversation over a glass of wine, right? Absolutely. All right, well, let's do it. <laughs> this is nice. Beautiful. Um, this is uh, uh, from near where I live. Uh, it's actually, I have a little project in the Priorat. This is one of our neighbors. This is Terroir Limite by a, um, a great winemaker named Dominic Uber. Mm-hmm. Um, it's a 100% Carignan. It's a 
fantastic story, fantastic wine. It's made in uh, terroir. A limite means like, like the edge of the terroir. And this is this is like extreme winemaking. Um, it's uh, high up in the mountains, very steep slopes, um, uh, kind of near Tarragona. How does extreme winemaking impact the wine quality? So there's a old Roman saying, I think, that um, wine loves a slope. Uh, what we say, I, I, I do some wine media, television, and film. Mm. And what I always say is uh, um, the, the nice part about making uh, films and television shows about wine is that they, they always built beautiful sets for us. Right, like uh, they, they make wine in beautiful places, but they're usually remote and hard. Like making wine, um, you you need a, a really specific set of um, weather and geological conditions in order to make good wine. Um, there's very few places in the world where you can make great wine, mm. and so. A lot of times, um, the slope is really important because the slope is what gets you um, access to the sun, mm -hmm. right? Like, there's a reason that uh, solar panels are kind of tilted towards the sun. Well, that slope um, is really important. Uh, the slope also provides kind of access to access to to rainfall, but not too much, right? You don't want you don't want it to pool in your uh, in your vineyard. You want to be able to control the amount of water. Um, you need to kind of, uh, you need to starve the vines a little bit. They need to struggle in order to get the best wine. So let's talk about the wine journey, right? Because you told me 23, you started your first company, which was in the IT field. You built the intranet for the US Navy, sold it at 29, and then you realized by 30, I don't want to do this tech startup thing anymore, right? Why? You know, a couple reasons. I, so my, uh, my first company was, um, uh, we built, like I said, we built the, the intranet for the US Navy. It was fun. It was really interesting. It was, it was challenging. Um, but like, I didn't, I didn't know what I was adding to the world, right? Like, okay, maybe I was making things a little bit more productive. I was making a, a couple of, uh, of um, you know, Navy guys more productive. But I don't know if I was adding any real value to the world. I, I was having, I had like a little existential crisis. Um, and so I, uh, the guys, the bank that sold me, that sold my company was uh, Allen & Company in New York. And um, they had, they did a bunch of work in, in the entertainment industry. And at the time, this was 1999, and we knew that there was a lot of um, interesting things that were going to happen mm. in entertainment with the internet, right? Like uh, Napster, I think, had just kind of broken through. And there were some, you know, some interesting rumblings that were happening. So... They sent me to, to California and I worked with a bunch of movie studios and television studios um, uh, to kind of think about strategy for what was going to happen to the internet. I kept telling them, you know, your whole business is going to change overnight. Like mm. you're going to, everything's going to be streaming. Um, you're not going to be making, you're not going to be renting DVDs at Blockbuster for much longer. And, um, and that scared them. Like they didn't want to hear that. They weren't very interested in that. It was a, it was too much change. They were, they were really comfortable with the business the way it worked. And in March, I think of 2000, when, when we had that little mini crash, uh, the dot com crash, uh, everyone just stopped wanting to talk to me. They were like, "All right, well, I'm glad this internet thing is over, and we don't have to worry about it anymore." Um, and you know, I could see just like anyone who knew how the internet worked at that time knew that these giant businesses were going to, if they didn't, if they didn't embrace the future, they were going to fail, uh, or they were going to have a, they were going to have hard times. And, um, and 
it just felt like I was rolling the rock up the hill. And uh, I decided that uh, if I was going to do something difficult, I might as well do something out, outdoors and more fun. So I ended up uh, moving to Argentina and starting a vineyard. Why Argentina? Well, there was a girl. She didn't. <laughs> there is always a girl. <laughs> there was a girl. Um, she danced tango, and she wanted to go to Buenos Aires. And so I was actually in Peru at the time. I went hiked yeah. the Inca Trail and was uh, was was living in in Cusco in Peru. And I I met this woman, and she was a tango dancer, and she wanted to move to Buenos Aires. So Peruvian. No, she was uh, Australian Greek. Mm. Um, I mean, we we were together for a short period of time, um, but she got me to Argentina, and she left, uh, but I stayed. Uh, I loved Argentina, and um, and I started doing some kind of simple real estate trades in Buenos Aires. This was just after the economic crisis in two thousand and one. Mm. So big currency crisis, big devaluation. The whole country was on sale. And I did some, you know, bought some apartments, sold some apartments in Buenos Aires, and then went to Mendoza with a friend. We always say we went for the weekend and stayed for 10 years. Mm. Um, I mean, he went for the weekend and stayed for the rest of his life. He's never leaving. Um, but we went and we looked around and like vineyard land was 10 cents on the dollar. And so, you know, I didn't know very much about wine. He knew a lot about wine. I didn't know very much. But I knew that ten cents on the dollar was was a good deal. So we bought, you know, a whole bunch of the best vineyard land in uh, in in Argentina, and built a really fantastic project there. And that's kind of how I got in the space. But you told me that from the moment you have the idea of making wine until you can actually sell it, it takes many years, right? And therefore, you have to find other ways to make money in between. Yeah. And you also had your strategy of the... You actually left technology, but you had a very kind of tech Silicon Valley approach to wine yeah. making and wine selling. I, could, wanna... I couldn't shake that, right? So I, we, um, we bought virgin land. So um, probably some of the last virgin... Uh, a vineyard land maybe in the world and um, we were lucky because we bought right across the street from Close de la Siete which is a uh, a French project in the Uca Valley in Argentina um, we bought three years after them and we paid 10 cents on the dollar we bought kind of the same land um, for 10 cents on the dollar but it was virgin right it was so rough that uh, the surveyor who did the final survey had to do it on horseback. There was no roads, like it was really rough. So, you know, we kind of did the math and we were like, okay, it's gonna take a year to level the ground. It's gonna take another year to plant the vines. Three years before we get our first, three years after that, before we get our first, uh, uh, our first real grapes. Then they gotta go in the barrel for two years. Then they gotta sit in a bottle for two years. So really from the day that we bought, well, the day that we put the deposit down on the property, our down payment, to the day that we made our first dollar selling wine, it was about 10 years. Yeah. And that's, a, that's, a, that's why in the wine industry, they think in generations, right? Like it's, I'm, I'm planting vines that's gonna make better wine for my grandchildren. Um, It's a, it's a different way of looking at the world. That's why no one in wine is probably there for the money, right? <laughs> Otherwise, you would be doing something else. That's exactly right. You know, they say that so the, people are there for the right reason, which is a, yeah. a very good point. Well, they say that the, the best way to make a, <clears throat> a small fortune in the wine industry is to start with a very much larger fortune. Um, I, uh, There is a similar saying in crypto, actually. Yeah. How did I make a million dollars? I started with 10 and then I... <laughs> I got I got wrecked on leverage or different things like that, right? <laughs> so there is more uh, commonalities between wine and crypto than we think. So, you know, the the standard um, what everyone says is like you want to you want to make great wine, then you uh, um, 
you start with uh, great land that has a nice slope and you know hot days and cool nights and you get a great winemaker and um, and you're gonna make great wine mm. and what they say is that the you know first time entrepreneurs solve for product second time entrepreneurs solve for distribution mm, absolutely and so when as soon as we started absolutely. I knew that we were going to make a great product, right? That's table stakes, making a great wine. But I wanted to solve for distribution. That's a big Silicon Valley saying, right? Yeah. yeah. The, the big founder solve for Peter distribution. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So that's kind of how we started looking at it, right? And so we, on the, you know, on one side, we were out, like, in the vineyard starting, you know, really for bringing bulldozers out on a thousand hectares. And like flattening the land, um, getting it ready to put in the post, digging. Uh, we had, I think, we dug five or six um, wells, d like deep wells, to get water. But that was building product, right? That was building this product that we were going to have in ten years. I wanted to start the distribution network early, so um, right in downtown Mendoza, we built two things. One was an information center so that anyone who didn't speak Spanish that wanted to visit, to do wine tourism, who wanted to like visit the wineries, could come in. We would have English-speaking team. And for free, we would build an itinerary for them. We would call the wineries and set up uh, appointments for them to go in and do tastings. Um, we'd, do, we'd create maps. We, we'd build these great itineraries. All you had to give us was your name and your phone number and your email address. And we captured thousands and thousands of email addresses of people that we knew loved Argentine wine. We knew loved us because we helped them. So they loved our brand. And we knew what wines they liked because they told us where they wanted to go. So building that database, I mean, we spent year. it didn't cost us very much, you know, uh, our, our English speaking staff there was, uh, you know, two bucks an hour. Um, and we paid them very well. Uh, the, the rent on the place was pretty cheap, but that built us, um, a huge database of customers. Mm. And then we built a tasting room. Uh, and the tasting room was also pretty interesting, right? We, that built us relationships with winemakers from all over because you could come in you could taste 80 different wines by the class. And what we what we did there is started a wine club. Even though we didn't have wine, we started relationships with all the winemakers that didn't have distribution in the States. So we would ship all their wine to the States. It would sit in a warehouse. And people would come into the tasting room. They would, you know, they would taste these wines. We'd talk to them about the wines. If they liked a wine, we'd say, hey, we can, sh we can ship a case to your house. We have, a, we have it in a warehouse in Napa. And, uh, and so we started shipping direct. We started a wine club where people could sign up for a wine club and get six bottles uh, every three months. And so by the time we actually had wine to sell, we were already making money. We already knew how to ship wine to the States. We already had a warehouse. And we had tens of thousands of customers ready as soon as we had wine to sell. Um, so we were kind of doing, we were building the distribution on one side while we were building the product on the other side. So that's one thing, right? The other thing you realized is as a guy with a tech mind, right, is in technology, Entrepreneurs make data-driven decisions. Yeah. In wine, there is almost no data. Or at least there was almost no data. That's right. How did you realize that? And what did you do to get more data? So there's still no data in the wine industry, right? And at some point, we, we can talk about Devin, which is, you know, we're a blockchain business. I always say that we're the, the most boring blockchain pitch in the world. And we're the most exciting wine pitch in the world. Mm. Um, and we're both things at the same time because we're, we're really focused on data. We're focused on data, customer acquisition. We're focused on kind of the, the, the meat and potatoes uh, rather than the, the, the fancy, you know, 1,000x meme coins. 
Um, but in the wine business, there's really there really isn't any data. Uh, and I started thinking about data um, on the production side because I didn't know anything about wine. I didn't know how to make great wine. Um, and every time I would ask someone, how, how can we make sure that we make great wine? They would say, oh, well, you just have to get a great winemaker. And I was like, well, I, you know, I don't know if I want to take this 10-year process of making wine and trust one person's intuition. Like, that didn't make sense to me as a, uh, as a business person, right? Like, that felt like too much risk. So to de-risk the winemaking, we started collecting data. So we hired a bunch of sommeliers because there was a big sommelier school in Mendoza. And we went and collected data from, we, we basically made a list of all of the great wines that came out of this region, that came out of Mendoza. And then for each of those wines, we started basically deconstructing it. We would go to the vineyards and take measurements in the vineyards. Okay, how, what's the elevation of this vineyard? What, what's the rootstock? of the vines, what clone, the, the kind of plant that they use. Um, what's the angle to the sun? How far are the rows apart? How far are the plants apart? Like we deconstructed how that grape was grown, what the vineyard was like that grew that grape um, and said, okay, if we want to grow a grape like this, we need to be at the same elevation. We need to be the same angle to the sun. We need to do some of these things the same. Um, and so we collected that for you know, 80 or 90 different wines. And in each wine, there were maybe four or five component grapes. So probably we looked at 300 different vineyards and took all of these data points from the vineyards. And then we went in and talked to the winemakers and said, okay, how did you make this one? You know, what, what was the bricks level at harvest? You know, a lot of these little data points. What, what kind of oak did you use? What kind of tanks did you use? Um, how long did it stay in oak? How long did mm -hmm. it stay in the bottle? And we took all those data points and kind of put it in a database and started really attacking that database over what should we, how should we plant our vineyards? And if you went and looked today at Google Earth and looked at our vineyard versus all the vineyards around us, ours looks like a, looks like a checkerboard. Right, it's a bunch of little tiny one-acre plots that all have a different angle to the sun. They all have different. They, they're basically formed in a different way. Whereas, you know, other vineyards they take you know a hundred hectares and they plant it all exactly the same way. Mm -hmm. We have all of these little tiny plots that kind of work almost like a like a laboratory. Um, and so what we had from the beginning was maybe some of these would fail, but most of them were mirroring other vineyards that we knew were going to be successful. And I think that really de-risked our winemaking. And that what it led to was higher take rates. Can you, um, can you explain yeah. what that is? A take rate? Yeah, sure. So whenever you plant take a vineyard... Take rate or tick rate? Take rate. Take rate. So a take rate is, you know, when you plant a vineyard some number of those vines are not going to make it, right? Mm -hmm. Some number are going to fail. Um, and especially when you replant a vineyard, right? When you, uh, when you um, graft the, 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 the actual vine to the rootstock, some number are just going to fail. And what we learned was that because we were really specific in how we created each of these vineyards, our take rate was close to 95%. Like very, very few vines failed. Whereas in a normal vineyard, your take rate is like 70, 80%. So we, we, we again, we de-risked so, even from the planting. So 70% take rate means 30%. 30% fail. Fails. Yeah. And you've got to replant them or regraft them. Which takes a lot of time, a lot of resource. And a lot of money, and but mostly time, and it, right? Because once, once you got to do right? it again the next year. Yeah, exactly, yeah. once a year. So that's kind of like the first step to, towards what you're doing today, right? How do we collect data to improve our processes in the wine industry? Yeah. But now you are onto the next level, right? Which is 
blockchain meets a rare wine? Yeah. What is Divin? So Divin, you know, decentralized wine, right? Like that was the that was the idea when we started. And you know, we approached blockchain and wine maybe in a little bit of a different way than than other um, other blockchain projects. We started off as a group of winemakers, wine professionals, industry professionals, thinking about how can blockchain solve real problems? Like what are the problems in the wine industry and how can how can blockchain solve that? And the the biggest problem really is connectivity to the consumer. So when you open a great bottle of wine, it was almost always made 10 years ago by somebody 10,000 miles away, right? When you're consuming it. So your connection to that, to that winemaker is, you know, is really uh, separated by, by a lot of time and space. Um, and what that means is the winemaker has a, a very difficult time doing three things. Three, three things that we, that we identified as being really important. One is product development, right? So almost any product that you make, and especially in the digital world, right, you're getting instant feedback from your consumers. Mm. You make a product, you know right away what they like, what they don't like, and you can make, you can make changes. In the wide world, you can't do that, right? Someone, they're, they're, not, they're not consuming your product for 10 years. Mm. So how do, and even when they do, there's no real avenue to get feedback from them. So we wanted to create a way to get feedback. The second problem is... Why is feedback so important? Well, and at, why has it not been solved until now? Is at, it just a technological issue or is there another reason? I think it's a technological issue. I mean, I, we, we, I, I've been trying to solve that problem for 20 years, mm. right? I did it through... We built a, an iPad wine list. Uh, that was one of my first uh, tech projects in wine. That was so that we could... It wasn't so that it would be easier for the consumer in the restaurant, although that was important, but it was to collect data that we could give to the winemaker that would give them feedback. Um, that, you know, that was, it was hard to do. Uh, we had some moderate success there, uh, but most of that data was more interesting to the, to the restaurant than it was to the winemaker. There's this app called, uh, I forgot the name, Divino? No. It's like... Vivino. Vivino. Sure. No, Vivino's great. Of people who, even my dad, right, use it. Yeah. How is that not helping collect the data that you're talking about? Or how is that not closing the entire loop so in a, a non-Web3 world, right? So Vivino is, Vivino's, a, look, it's great. I was a user of Vivino for a long time. I don't use it so much anymore. Um, most of the winemakers that we work with don't really use it. Why? It's really because the incentives on Vivino are misaligned. So think about Twitter. I'm also not on Twitter. But uh, the incentives on Twitter are for the loudest voices in the room, the most aggressive, maybe the most controversial voices mm. get rewarded. So on Vivino, that's the same thing, right? Like if you say... I like this wine, it was great. No one's gonna care. Um, if you say some <laughs> crazy, whether, it, whether it's a criticism or even an accolade, but like the more extreme you are on Vivino with your public review, the more attention you get. And so the incentives are not for you to provide real feedback. Mm. Your incentive is to make a name for yourself. It's to game the system. Yeah, that's it's right. It's a very web to that's platform right. that's kind right. of game, right? How do I game the system to, yeah. to increase my personal score or my followers or whatever, right? Exactly right. So because of that, a lot of winemakers, you know, they don't really want they don't want to engage because they're not really interested in that kind of feedback, right? They don't want the most extreme voices in the room. That doesn't help them with product development. 
It doesn't help them with messaging. It doesn't help them with marketing or packaging. Like that's the help that they need, right? They need to, if they, the more information they have on consumption, the more consumption data they have, meaning where is it consumed? When is it consumed? And remember, in the wine industry, consumption and purchase are separated in a way that is unique. Think about nearly everything that you buy, everything, you're consuming right away. You know, a t-shirt, you're wearing it right away, a car, you're driving it off the lot, a tennis racket, you're playing tennis with it that day. You know, maybe an avocado, you wait a couple of days. But for the most part, everything you buy, you're consuming right away. With wine, you're buying it and consuming it 10 years later. Mm. So that separation between purchase and consumption um, creates a real distance for the winemaker that they need to overcome in order to use consumption data as feedback on, you know, there are a lot of winemakers that say, I don't care what the customer thinks, I'm going to make the very best wine I can. That's great. And I'll hope for the best. That said, yeah. you know, most winemakers are going to make a second wine or a, thir- a second wine and a third wine. They're going to try to grow their business overall. That maybe they won't change the recipe for the, for the wine, but they might change their packaging. They might change their messaging or marketing around what is happening on the consumption level. And without that data, it's really hard to grow a business. Try to grow a business today mm. without having some sort of customer feedback, it's almost impossible. So that's the, that's the consumption data part of it. The second part, which is again, pretty unique to the wine industry, is supply chain data, right? So winemakers, especially luxury winemakers, they have a limited amount of product. I can only make a thousand cases this year of this wine. Thousand cases, 12,000 bottles. That's a, that's a pretty average sized winery in the luxury space. It's making a 50 or $100 bottle of wine. If you only make a thousand cases, how do you know where to send it? Do I send four cases or five cases to Norway? Mm. Do I send five cases or 10 cases to Seoul? How many cases do I send to Zurich? How many cases do I send to Singapore, mm. right? I don't know how many. Without consumption data, your supply chain is really inefficient. And if you only have a limited amount of product, you want your supply chain to be as efficient as possible. That's how you're gonna maximize your revenue and that's kind of how you're gonna maximize your business. So knowing where your products are being consumed and when they're being consumed helps with supply chain data and you know, obviously depletion reports and supply chain data. The third thing and we talk about this all the time, is, is, um, is customer acquisition. People talk about customer acquisition a lot for direct-to-consumer businesses, right? If I'm going to, like, what's my customer acquisition cost if I'm going to sell a product directly to a consumer? Well, in the wine business, customer acquisition doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to sell directly to that consumer. It means you're going to acquire that customer as a loyal customer for your brand. Like, when you walk into a wine shop, or really even a grocery store, there's 500 different wines that you can pick from. How do you decide what to pick? If you're, if you're, if you're a good brand and you're acquiring a customer, they're gonna buy your wine again, because they bought it, they like it, they know your story, maybe it's part of their identity. They're gonna keep buying it over and over again. So when you acquire a customer, it means they know your story. Maybe they're buying it direct from you, or maybe they're just buying it repeatedly from you know, the wine shop or ordering it at the restaurant. You can't really acquire customers in wine, mm. right? You can't advertise. Probably nobody listening to this podcast has ever seen an advertisement for luxury wine. I haven't. They don't advertise on television. <laughs> There's no print advertising. They won't let them advertise on social media. So if you can't advertise, how do you acquire customers? How do yeah. you how do you yeah. tell someone your story? Probably most people listening to this podcast, me included, to making this podcast happen is think that the wine industry or the rare wine industry is kind of like old school and not interesting. Yeah. I would rather buy I mean meme coins than buying a bottle of wine. For me even. 
Yeah. Like, for me, wine is made to drink, not even to collect, right? Because the collection of wine sounds like something that older people would do, right? Yeah. Without, I'd never really ask myself the question, but I, I'm not really aware of it, right? Well, so, you, but that's right. And that's because, you know, wine investment has really been captured by, you know, the boomer generation mm. and, and my generation mm. because of access. They've, you know, when you think about um, the real investment assets or the, 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 the asset classes that are out there, like most of them have been captured by the boomers, right? If it's real estate, yeah. um, you know, younger generation is priced out, stocks and bonds, like it's, it's uh, that's, that's really all controlled by boomers with, uh, with big hedge funds. Wine is the same way, right? For, for the last hundred years, wine is a great performer, right? The wine as an asset class is maybe $250 billion, about $10 billion a year in turnover. But it's completely taken over by the, by the older generations. What we think we can do by tokenizing wine is open it up to younger generations that can mm -hmm. get asymmetrical information, that can get um, transparency, and can invest in something that's fun and interesting. So if your mother comes to you today and asks you, why should we put the wine on the blockchain? And you need to answer to your mother in a sentence or two. Sure. What's your answer? Um, I tell her that wine, especially like we're we're not talking about your your Tuesday night two buck chuck, right? That's a that's a very American reference. Um, but uh, we're not talking about your regular Tuesday night wine, right? The wines that we're that we're putting on the blockchain are luxury and investment grade wines, mm. right? Wines that are 50, 100, 500, 1,000 dollars. So the reason we put it on the blockchain is because we turn it from a possession into an asset. We're creating a digital deed of ownership, or in Europe they call it a digital product passport. So each bottle has a chain of ownership, has chain of custody, has anti-fraud and anti-counterfeit protections, has elements of provenance that you can see and understand, um, that turns that bottle into something that more resembles an investment asset mm. and less resembles a, you know, a, a, a disposable possession. And for investment grade wine, that's really important, right? You've got a $250 billion asset class, big asset class, but can you borrow against it? No. Mm. Can you insure your wine collection? No. Is there price transparency, price discovery? Not really. How do you, if you how do you even enter the market, right? Like we talked about this, we talked about this the uh, the other night, right? If you wanted to invest a hundred thousand dollars right now in stocks, you could do it in two minutes on your phone. Bonds, two minutes on your phone. Gold, you want to buy a hundred thousand dollars in gold? Ten minutes. Mm. Real estate. You could certainly make an offer. Maybe you couldn't close a deal because you got to do some paperwork. But you could you could buy real estate intelligently in ten minutes on your phone. But if you wanted to if you wanted to invest a hundred thousand dollars in in investment grade wine, this two hundred and fifty billion dollar asset class that has had a thousand percent return in the last twenty years, better return than gold. You wouldn't be able to do it in a week. Because the inf there's no transparency. It's a completely opaque market. There's, there's, uh, there's gatekeepers everywhere. It's impo you have to find someone that you trust mm. to, in order to get access. So we think that by, and I know you asked for a two-sentence answer, and I, I think I'm more than two sentences. But, but the idea is we turn wine from a possession into an asset. Okay. By... 
by building that digital deed of ownership. I'm not very good at two sentences, sorry. <laughs> I gotta be more pithy. I'll figure it out. Maybe another glass of wine. I was I'll thinking about it. I was like, maybe a bit more wine. <laughs> or maybe it gets worse. <laughs> ah, hard to say. Hard to say. Um, you talked about gatekeepers, right? Yeah. There is a lot of gatekeepers. So, which sounds like a negative thing. Before going into the kind of negative side or aspect of gatekeepers, can you identify the main actors in the wine industry who are the middlemen, who are the gatekeepers and then we'll basically think about why are they needed but what can be improved sure today. so I think the, the main gatekeepers um, in the wine industry is um, it's called the, the Place de Bordeaux Uh, especially when, when you're talking about investment grade wine or, or, or luxury wine, it's the, the Place de Bordeaux, which is a affiliation of what's called negociants um, in France. What's a negociant? A negociant um, usually buys wine from the winery and then sells it to an importer or a distributor. Um, mm. They're like the first, the first layer of middlemen in the wine industry. And um, they have, they certainly have provided a lot of value in the last, you know, that, that it's like a 200 year old system um, of, of negociants in France. Um, and, and what you'll see is that, you know, lots of Napa wineries now sell on the Place de Bordeaux. Lots of Italian, high end Italian wines, Penfold sells on the Place de Bordeaux. So it's not just Bordeaux wine. Champagne sells on the Place de Bordeaux. It's become the marketplace for um, producers and then importers and distributors on the other side. They're, they're the main gatekeeper. And I think they provided a lot of value for a long time. And I think they still provide value. They're, they're good at matchmaking. However... They've taken an outsized share. The middlemen in the industry have taken an outsized share of the revenue. I think they take relatively little risk, and they take an awful lot, really the lion's share of the profits. Can, um, can you give uh, an example of risks that they're not taking, right? You mentioned well, cash risk. So I talked to you about, about my experience as a, as a proprietor, right, mm. making wine. I mean, we took risk by buying the land uh, and investing money in, um, in getting the land ready to plant and then planting the vines and then taking care of the vines for three years. And then all of the money that went into harvest and winemaking and barrels and bottles and labels and branding uh, and everything else that went into creating that product, blood, sweat, and tears for 10 years. That's the real risk in winemaking. Usually, the negociants or the middlemen, they're, they're, they're not, um, not only are they not taking, taking those kinds of risks, but they're not really even taking any cash risks, right? They're usually buying the wine on credit and selling it on credit for a, for, with, a, with, a, with a, a more narrow window. So they're buying it with 120 days and they're selling it with 90 days. So they're not even taking any cash risk. Um, They certainly, you know, created a lot of value over time by building, um, building the customer base, mm. by creating the distribution, right? Mm. We talked earlier, um, you know, smart businessmen build distribution, you know, the, the first time entrepreneurs build product, yeah. second time entrepreneurs build distribution. Well, they built distribution and that's why they take, that's why they're able to take the lion's share of the revenue. But I think that that, I, I think that that needs to change. Um, and I think you need to start, you need to see winemakers that are taking all the risk um, and that are creating these wonderful products. I think they need to start making more of the rewards. So you're clearly saying that there is some people or actors in the wine industry that are incentivized to not have the wine put on the blockchain. Well, to have things not changing. 
I, which is the case in probably most industries today, right? I, I think, think about Bitcoin and the banks, right? It's like a good sure. example. I think every industry has incumbents yeah. that are um, that are threatened by technology, um, and that's been true for fifty years, right? Probably longer, right? The 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 buggy whip um, salesmen were were really threatened when the when the car was introduced. So um, I think every new technology threatens the incumbents. That said, every new technology usually um, overall in an industry makes the pie bigger and creates opportunities mm. for everyone. So I think that that the um, that certainly there are incumbents that want to keep the status quo because that's how they're making all their money. But I think that there's also forward-looking incumbents that look at the industry as a whole and say, and, and this is, you know, when we first started what we were doing, we looked at the industry as a whole and we said, what is the, what's, what are the biggest threats to the wine industry? What are the problems that need to be solved? And the biggest threats were the consumers, especially the young, the, the next generation of consumers, their expectations are changing. 100%. And unless the industry changes, um, they're going to lose those. They're going to they're going to they're going to have a, a big problem with the next generation of consumers. I know that I buy wine the same way that my parents bought wine and they buy wine the same way that their parents bought wine, right? My kids that are digitally native that are used to that that abhor opacity Right, they they need transparency. They they are they are rooted in transparency. They're used to finding any answer in two seconds on their phone. They also want experiences rather than products. Right, mm. they they don't care so much about stuff. Right, stuff 100%. has been raining on them since they were born. They want experiences. They want things that they'll remember. They want things that are unique and interesting. Um, it's, it's what I think. They also um, want to want connections. Connections are really important, and most you know uh, consumers that are that make a brand part of their identity, they build a connection with that brand digitally. Usually, mm -hmm. with wine, you can't do that. It's really hard to do, and we think that um, that what we're doing at Devin is creating the rails mm. for to connect winemakers and wine lovers. How concretely? So I'm, I'm basically referring to what you showed us yesterday. And if we think about this Vivino app that is not onboarding enough winemakers, right? Sure. How is what Divin is building covering the entire kind of loop or feedback loop sure. that everyone in the wine industry needs except the incumbents, right? Yeah. But that might not have a choice if it's powerful enough, right? So what we've built is, and I've, I've kind of hit on this a little bit, but we've basically built the universal protocol mm. to put a bottle of wine on the blockchain, right? This is the digital deed of ownership. We call it a digital cork mm. that has all of these specialized elements, right? It tracks... Um, chain of ownership, mm. it tracks mm. chain of custody, provenance, anti-counterfeit, anti-fraud, anti, uh, anti so on and so forth. Um, we've added to that a mechanism that, um, that also is kind of unique for other assets. You know, most assets live forever, live forever right? Mm. But wine, someday, if you're lucky, you get to drink it. And when you drink it, that, that, that asset is destroyed. So we needed to create a way to destroy the, um, the asset. And what we did, right now we're doing that on a kind of an incentive basis, where when you drink a bottle of wine, you can really easily with your phone, you can destroy that, that asset, um, the digital cork. And then what you get in return is what we call a tasting token, but it's an it's a authentic proof of experience that says, OK, I tasted that wine. And what that usually comes with is some rewards and status from the winemaker, right? The winemaker now says, okay, 
you're an authentic consumer. Um, we know that you've tasted our wine. Uh, I want to provide you with, you know, you, you, you get enough of these tasting tokens. We're going to make you a, like a premier crew mm. member of the winery. So you get some status in the winery. Maybe you get access to, to drops or access to um, tastings or whatever. Um, and maybe we want to give you a reward. We want to invite you to a winemaker dinner. Mm. Um, so that provides that really simple connectivity between the winemaker and the consumer. It's basically like like building a loyalty program. Absolutely. But that's probably more interesting for wine passionates, right? Sure. For example, I love a good wine, but I'm not a wine passionate. Yeah. So I need something more. You know where I'm going? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So to I need another glass for this one. <laughs> I need something more to kind of provide you my data, right? Mm -hmm. Something where I'm thinking, oh, it's a no-brainer. Something I'm already, I don't even want to say, oh, I'm about data privacy or anything. I'm more like, ah, oh, loyalty program, whatever. Cool, I could do it, but like I'm not necessarily thinking about it. Maybe I forget, right? But there is maybe a mechanism that I know you implemented because we did a test yesterday evening, yeah. right? That is super cool. That will e make even people like me who care or not don't care about building a profile, right? They're still going to do it. What is it? So what we're launching later this year in September at Breakpoint is VinCoin. So it's a native token built on Solana. Um, and it is, in the beginning like air miles for wine. It's a, um, it's a, uh, a token that the winemaker attaches to the bottle. The bottle makes its way through the supply chain. Then when you open the bottle, you can claim that VinCoin or you get, you get transferred that VinCoin in exchange for that data going back to the winemaker. So now the winemaker knows where their bottles are, when they're being opened, if you uh, if you opt in, you even they even get your customer information, right? Like you can say they, they can send you rewards or send you offers. Um, so the winemaker gets consumption data, which mm. helps them with product development. They get supply chain data because they know where those bottles are being consumed. That helps them with 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 supply chain optimization, and they get customer acquisition. Mm. Super valuable to the winemaker, mm. incredibly valuable. And what the consumer gets is VinCoin, which is like air miles. They can go and buy more wine with that. They can go buy experiences, you know, purchase experiences like, you know, everything from a, a tasting at the winery to a harvest experience to, like I said, winemaker dinners. Um, or they can take that VinCoin and use it like any other loyalty point with other luxury goods and services, right? Because lots and lots of brands are interested in connecting with consumers who like to open $50 bottles of wine, mm. right? Like that's a great consumer for the Four Seasons or Louis Vuitton or Gucci, or we actually have a, a deal with Rolls-Royce, interestingly mm. enough. Um, they wanna identify high-end wine consumers to invite to the F1. Can I sell my VinCoin? Uh, my yeah, so we'll, yeah, so we'll, we're, we're planning to launch VinCoin on a number of exchanges. Um, uh, and if you want to trade it for dollars, you can. We don't recommend it. We think there's better things to do with mm. VinCoin. We're, we're actually going to launch a marketplace where you can buy a ton of wine with VinCoin. Nice. Um, but VinCoin for us is the the loyalty currency for the wine industry. And um, in this first kind of iteration, we think that there's that it's going to be a, an incredibly valuable um, uh, instrument for certainly for any wine lover to um, uh, to, you know, uh, uh, what do they say? Glam up your your wild life, your, your wine life. Mm. You mentioned before that there is low liquidity in the luxury wine industry, right? 
Do you want to elaborate on that? How so something like what you're building could help improve liquidity, which is basically one of the promises of blockchain, right? And sure. tokens, and how it can help. I don't know if you say that in English, but undust yeah. the wine industry, right? And make yeah. it more attractive to young people sure. as an investment asset class. So let's talk about the investment grade, right? So investment grade wine, a lot of people have asked me to uh, you know, define investment grade wine. It's actually really simple. Investment grade wine is any wine, any bottle that has value in the secondary market, right? If someone's willing to buy it in the secondary, then it's investment grade. What that really means is that that's scarce, is that there's, there's actual forced scarcity. Um, and for... In the investment grade space, you're looking at the tiny wineries around the world. There's about 30,000 small, pardon me, small independent wineries around the world that make um, luxury wine. There's about 300 that make investment grade wine. Um, those are mostly in Burgundy, Bordeaux, Barolo, Napa, Champagne, um, the Southern Rhone. Mm. And... Um, and there's, you know, regulatory reasons why uh, why those wineries can't make more wine, why their why their why their wine is scarce. There's a limited quantity that they can make, but there's also just the physical reality. Like there's only so many so many vines you can grow in that particular terroir to make that quality of wine. So the second point makes sense to me, but why is the first one regulatory, regulatory reason? Well, for for many years in in France, in particular, but also. You see the same thing in Italy. You see the same thing in um, uh, in Germany, in the United States, in Napa, where um, you know if you want to plant new vines, you have to get approval by the um, by the by the local regulatory board. If you want to, in France, you know one one of my one of my good friends is a, a winemaker named Stefano Seo, who um, learned to be a winemaker in Bordeaux and moved to Paso Robles, California. And when you ask him why he moved, he said, because I wanted to plant vines in Bordeaux that weren't allowed. Meaning that he wanted to plant a varietal in Bordeaux and they told him, no, you can't plant the varietal. You can only plant these varietals in Bordeaux. And so he said, well, I want to plant whatever I want. So he moved to California and has built a very successful career there. But um, that, that kind of regulatory regime has created, you know, very narrow guidelines for what you're allowed to grow in certain places. And what that what that's what that's built is a system of scarcity in the luxury and especially in the investment grade wine industry. So when there's scarcity, big demand, very, very small supply, and when you've got a 15 to 20 year window before you can actually consume the wine, that creates this opportunity for trading. The regulatory reason, is it because of lobbies like you would have in other industries? Because there is some interest, economic interest from some big actors that can influence politics and regulations, or is it another reason? I don't know if it's in a if it's necessarily a big actor. What it usually is is a collective, right? Okay. In yeah. Bordeaux, it's the collective of all the wineries got together. They form a regulatory board, and that regulatory board makes the rules. Mm. Um, and you know, a lot of those rules are to protect the brand, right? If you want to protect the brand of Bordeaux, sure. um, they make those rules to protect Bordeaux, the status of Bordeaux mm. as a brand, or the status of Champagne, or the status of, of Barolo. Um, so typical investment grade wine will leave the winery at 100, 120 bucks a bottle. Um, and then over the course of 15 years, we'll change hands three to four times, usually doubling every time. So by the time it's actually consumed, the average price is about $800 US dollars when it's consumed. Um, 
so that's kind of interesting, right? It's a, it's actually created, um, like I said, in the last 20 years, about a thousand percent return for um, mm. the LiveX basket of investment grade wines. So better return than gold, I think a better return than the S&P. Um, and with relatively low volatility. So it makes a really great investment product. The problem is nobody has access. Like it's very hard to invest. Mm. Um, it's hard to get price discovery. It's hard to understand price movement. Um, it's very hard to understand. Um, I mean, you can have a general idea for scarcity, but you don't really understand like how many bottles of this wine are left. By creating a digital deed of ownership, we'll know relatively precisely how many bottles of any given vintage are left, how many bottles of 2001 Chateau Palmer are left on the market. So I can know how to price the remaining bottles. Um, with liquidity or, or price transparency global, I, you know, every bottle of 2001 Chateau Palmer is trading basically at the same price. Um, that provides, you know, price discovery, price transparency, which we think brings a ton of liquidity into the marketplace. And more importantly, it provides access to other investors. I, I think that there's a really, you know, most investment grade wines, you know, wines that sell for, Two thousand or five thousand or ten thousand dollars a bottle today. Ten years ago, they weren't investment grade. Ten years ago, you were buying them for for nothing. Mm -hmm. uh, some of the best collectors in the world, the reason that they got to be great collectors was not because they were buying wines that were already known to be investment grade. It's because they were identifying wines early on and buying them, um, and then they became investment grade. We think there's a really interesting opportunity there for younger investors that are, you know, priced out of the real estate market, that feel like like the stock market is is uh, is rigged, or you mm. know, <laughs> rightly think that the stock market is rigged um, by by big players that can find in the same way that they can invest in meme coins because they have asymmetrical information. Um, and because they can play in a place where the big players can't play, right? We think wine creates a really interesting opportunity for that as well. It's an experiential purchase. It's something where you, know, you can invest in things that you're passionate about. You can go and do the research and invest in things that are um, where you can have more information than anybody else. And more importantly, you can invest in a place where hedge funds can't play, right? Where the, the big players can't really get in. There's not, there's not, there's not a play for a hedge fund to, uh, or for Ken Griffin to go and play in uh, investment grade wine. So we're trying to create a, um, the, the technology that creates a level playing field for exchanges, marketplaces all over the world to bring in new liquidity into the marketplace. So you're predicting some pretty big changes in the next couple of years in the wine industry, which are well needed. What's your biggest prediction for the next 12 months? The next 12 months. Um, it, it's really hard to think of uh, the wine industry in, in 12 months. Um, you can answer I, regarding anything else than the wine industry. Oh, my, my life wine so i think what we're going to see in the next 12 months is um is the next level of adoption in crypto mm. um meaning i was there in the early days when um you know when the internet was uh, you couldn't change the background color of your website, right? It had to be gray. Uh, you couldn't change the font. Um, and for a long time, that was the case. Uh, I remember the days when my, my parents said that it would be crazy, insane to put your credit card number on the internet. Mm -hmm. Like, how could you ever buy something on the internet? Why would you ever share your credit card number? It's going to get stolen. You're going to get your bank account ripped off, um, you know, it's 
very, very dangerous to put your credit card number on the internet. Now, obviously, everybody does that every day. So I think that, I don't know if it's 12 months or 18 months, it's hard to, hard to know what the actual timeline is, but I think that, that there's a step change that's gonna happen when you're gonna go from only the early adopters who are in today to the next, the next level of, I wanna say, um, you know, civilian adoption. Right, people that are 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 regular civilians that aren't, you know, tech nerds, that will be able to participate in blockchain and crypto, um, either because they feel more confident, or because it's been abstracted out and they they don't, you know, they don't they don't know about wallets and they don't know about, you know, seed phrases, but they can still participate um, in more functional projects and that's that's what we're building right we're building a functional project where you can claim a a you know somebody opens a great bottle of wine mints you a tasting token and a uh um and some vincoin and you don't know that you've got a wallet you don't know that that's an nft mm. i i say all the time and i'll and then i'll stop talking but uh you know my dad told me 20 years ago, I, I was, he's a big music guy. And I was like, let me, let me put some MP3s. Let me give you some MP3s. I'll, I'll rip some CDs and like, I'll rip your whole CD collection. I'll put your MP3s on your computer. And he was like, I don't know how to work an MP3. I'm never gonna be able to do that. Well, I challenge anybody to like find like the, the, find the word MP3 on Spotify anywhere. You can't find MP3. Like you're just listening to music. Mm. And my dad listens to Spotify all day. Mm. So that change has to come. When we stop talking about NFTs and we stop talking about wallets and mm. potentially we even stop talking about Web3 and we just start talking about the actual value that's mm. being driven for the consumer. I met a couple of uh, winemakers who try to do, to put the wine on the blockchain. And most of them told me that they tried, but it's pretty much impossible or that they kind of abandoned because of these big actors, right? And my answer to them was, but we need people who are gonna do the hard work, right? And who are gonna spend the next five or 10 years trying to make this happen. And that's how big changes happen in industries. If no one tries or if uh, people abandon too early, then nothing is gonna happen. So I wanted to, t to thank you for three things. The first one is for bringing this amazing wine today the second is for doing this podcast which was great a great conversation and the third one is for trying to do what others think is too hard because we need more entrepreneurs who don't who believe they can change because that's how basically change happen look i i appreciate that and and thank you for inviting me on this has been uh like really really great conversation but i um you know to to the other folks that are that have tried to do wine on the blockchain and and i've i've run into a few of them and some of them are have been very successful and some of them have not been i think the the secret to what we're doing and you know we've we've been doing it for a couple of years and we've had some some pretty good success and i think the secret to that is we're thinking about things in generational terms i'm thinking about building tools that my my kids are going to use mm. um, and that the winemakers kids are going to use. Uh, I, I don't need adoption tomorrow. Um, what we need to do is um, set a, set a big goal and move there, you know, bite by bite. Um, so uh, we have a, we have a very, very long-term goal in mind. Thank you, David. Thank you, Kevin. It's been great. <laughs>